A2, we've got some old pool pottery, cruet sets, a lot of it there actually, and I'm start at £30 for that lot, 30, 30 pound bid, 30, 35, 40, 45, 45 at the back, 45 on the whole lot, 50 now, 50, 55, 55 right at the back, 55, 60 anybody else, 55, 830, 82 we've got the pool pottery again, Calypso vases this time. Pool in Dorset has for the past 140 years been home to one of the oldest and most popular potteries, pool pottery. It has stood the test of time to the present day from humblest origins. It was Jesse Carter who bought up an old tile manufacturing company in 1873 and by 1895 had established Carter & Co. The wares produced then were mainly floor and wall tiles and architectural decorations. By the 1920s, now under the direction of Jesse's son Owen Carter, the pottery had become established in the production of innovative and colourful ceramics. In 1921, John Adams and Harold Stabler joined the Carter family company and formed Carter, Stabler and Adams. Carter, Stabler and Adams' main remit was to produce domestic and decorative pottery. The distinctive styles and colours of the pottery were soon established and continued only interrupted by government restrictions during the Second World War. Just before the war they had about a hundred potters here or a hundred people decorate, uh, decorating and potting here. Um, he, the government forbade them to, um, to make ornamental wares during the thing and they, they could only make utilitarian ware. Most of the men went off to war and that sort of thing so it was um, quite devastating for the pottery and it was very few people, I think it was um, after the war, I think it was only about 14 people left uh, actually potting because of, you know, the displacement of people and that sort of thing. So. In the 1950s, Lucien Myers took over the pottery and Robert Jefferson was successfully appointed as designer. Jefferson, together with Guy Sydenham, established a new craft studio at Poole, which formed a craft section, encouraging the throwers and painteresses to add their own free individuality to the pieces, known as the Delphis Range. In 1964, Carter, Stable and Adams became part of the Pilkington Group, and changed its name to Pool Pottery Limited. Alan White, now a master potter of pool pottery, joined as a young man in 1966. My first memory was walking in and watching Guy Sydenham on the wheel. Um, and I thought, yeah, I want to be like that. I want to do... He was an incredible potter, and I, I loved to watch him work. And so... Um, when I came in for my interview, he was the one that interviewed me and I watched him on the wheel and then I had to get on the wheel and make a pot. Um, I've still got that pot in the attic somewhere. <laughs> the fact that we did do studio wear and we did hand stuff is, was exciting to me because that's what I wanted to do. I didn't want to work on a machine and do that sort of thing. I wanted to do the hand pottery. So that, that's inspiring. Um, We've had lots of people, um, Tony, um, Tony Morris, Guy Sydenham, that I've had the pleasure to work with, who are incredible, skillful people in their in their field, and um, you know I've had that journey to be able to learn from them. And um, the good thing is now I can pass that skills on to somebody else, which is what we're we're trying to do at this present time. I appreciate the tradition, what we call the traditional pottery, far more than I ever used to as a youngster. And I look at it now and I've, I see some incredible collections that people have got in their own private collections. And I look at that and I think, my goodness, that really, when you consider going back to the time that it was, that was an incredibly advanced pottery, you know, for, for its time, design-wise. And, and pool pottery has always been at the forefront of design. So, you know, that's, um, that's really good for us, really. The main thrust of the 60s was the Delphis range. Delphis being um, dolphin, basically. Um, and the dolphin is our symbol, and it has been because it's a symbol of pool as well. The, the technique, first of all, as I say, standard shapes. So you, you get the potters that would make the standard shapes. From there, it, after it had been fired the first time, you would decorate it. So. The decoration was again an on-glaze decoration, so painting on top of the glaze that was put onto the pot. So it would have been sprayed with the glaze. And then they used a wax resist to draw the outline of the pattern. 
and then they'd fill it in with colours. But that was complete freedom. The Delphis ranges continued through to the 1970s and traditional hand painting carried on, supported by many new products. Every piece is unique, the designs created by the decorators themselves. Following on from the Delphis range, the Aegean range was born out of the expressive and free atmosphere of the pottery. The Aegean range was basically on, on, on the uh, fired piece. Um, you would spray a glaze, which was usually a chestnut glaze, on top of which the girls that were decorating it would paint the design with a rubber resist. And more colours, when, when that was dry, more colours were sprayed on the top of that and then the rubber resist peeled away and so you got a, when, when it was fired, you got a, a dark pattern on top of some bright colours on the top. In the 1970s there was an awareness of the pottery's place in history. Highlighted by the centenary in 1973, a major exhibition at the Victoria and Albert Museum and the visit of Her Majesty the Queen. In the 1990s, Peter Mills led a management buyout of Poole Pottery and David Queensbury took over as art director. There was a return to the more artistic feel of the earlier years with the revival of the Poole Studio, the introduction of the innovative living glaze ranges by Alan Clark and Anita Harris and many new tableware designs. Just after the new millennium, Poole Pottery vacated the East Quay factory for new premises on an industrial estate and the site was redeveloped into an apartment and retail block. The new owner, Geoffrey Zemmel, had no long-term plan for maintaining the traditional pottery and in December 2006, staff were told the factory was closing. Over 300 were left jobless just before Christmas. In order to stay open, Poole Pottery sold off its oldest and most valuable pieces and collections. In 2011, the pottery was sold to the Denby Holdings Group, whilst factory production is carried out in Stoke-on-Trent. As far as the future, I think we've got a better future now that we're under Denby. Um, because we have their know all, their technical backup, their, you know, the assistance to, to pull us forward. They're a bigger company, they have, they have the resources to be able to take us forward. It is a niche market and um, at some stage that's not going to sell, so we have to develop into new colours. But the red is so strong and it's, it's difficult to find something that is comparable. Despite a turbulent history and an unsure future, what was and always will be at the heart of the company are the skills that are passed down through the generations. One of the things interesting things about Paul is that um, there's always been a crossover. So you've got so many sort of like from, from one generation to the next, there's always been a crossover. So like when I came in, Guy Sydenham and, and Tony Morris were there and now I'm here and now I'm passing my information on to somebody else. And that's how it sort of progressed all the way through the years, really. The craft skills that were introduced by Carter at the beginning of the story of Paul Pottery are still around today and provide hope for the company during uncertain times. Pool pottery continues to flourish and to produce wares that are right for the time. For now, the world of pottery can keep spinning.